Hello and welcome to another edition of Up Close. We're coming to you from the beautiful Three Angels Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wichita, Kansas. And we're pleased to have you with us and also our live audience join us. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that has become increasingly serious in this country. In fact, it is the second leading cause of preventable death in America. We're talking, of course, about the problem of obesity. And even though we are some of the most weight-conscious people in the world, the problem is getting worse and worse. In fact, this last year uh, in America, I'm told that we spent over $90 billion because of this problem. Those that are age 5 and under, 18 million of them are now considered overweight. We're going to be exploring how we got this way, what some of the contributing factors are, and especially what we can do about it in today's program. Our first guest is Naomi Coleman from Harper, Kansas. She has worked for years as a secretary book bookkeeper, and today she enjoys collecting and selling antiques. And in her leisure time, she enjoys being with those grandkids. As a child, Naomi had no weight problems and was very active, though she did not eat everything that was completely right. However, in her 20s, Naomi found that the pounds started piling up. Listen to what she told us a little bit earlier. In my 20s, when the kids were a little bit older, I noticed that I was starting to gain weight. Um, I was eating out more often, and I was fixing a lot of processed foods. It was easier to fix uh, macaroni and cheese and, and things out of a box than it was to try to figure out how to cook something correct. We uh, didn't eat regular meals a lot. Uh, at that time when my kids were growing up, I was divorced, and so a lot of times we didn't just sit down and eat a, a, a three-course meal. So we ate more junk food, and the, the pounds started piling up. In my early 30s is when I noticed that I was a little too heavy, and a couple times I had thought about trying to lose weight, but I never really knew what to do. Uh, I would decide that I was going to lose weight, but deciding isn't enough. You still have to be able to know what to do and how to do it. And our lifestyle hadn't changed. I was still eating out, and when I'd go out to eat, I would have, you know, if you went out to eat, you felt like you needed to have something really special, like a steak and, and potatoes, french fries, and all the greasy and, and the things that really aren't good for you. So as time went on, I just kept piling on the pounds, and I was about maybe 30 pounds overweight at that time. As I started gaining the more, more weight, I was starting to be a little more embarrassed about being heavy. I was single at the time, and you don't really want to be a, a, a fat single person. Uh, you want to feel good about yourself. You want to feel sexy. You want to feel attractive. And I wasn't feeling those things because I was getting heavier. Uh, a lot of times I think we mask how we feel with humor, and that is one of my biggest areas that I would do. Uh, you know, a, a fat person is a happy person. Uh, everybody likes a, a happy person. And even though I didn't feel good about gaining weight, I still didn't feel bad enough to do anything serious about it. Well, that's true. Isn't it true that things begin to creep up on us, just like Naomi said? And that's certainly true when it comes to weight. We're glad that Naomi Coleman is with us this evening, and we'd like to welcome her to the program at this time. Welcome, Naomi. We're glad that you could come. And, and, you know, to talk about this type of subject, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to do, so we're thankful that you could come and talk with us. Um, you know, I noticed in that, that clip that, it, that things just started to creep up on you. Is that right? That's right. They did. And uh, you, it, it wasn't something that was really a big deal at first, but then it started to get a little bit more something that came to your attention. A little more noticeable. Now, you know, as we were talking, you told me that uh, one day you were talking to a close friend and they said something that kind of shocked you. Yeah, she told me I was getting fat. Did she say it just like that? Yes, she did. She didn't meander around at all? No. Nope. Well, how exactly did she say it? <laughs> You're getting fat, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you take that? 
No, I just kind of made a joke out of it. I knew I was getting fat. I really didn't need her to tell me. And did you tell her that you didn't need her to tell you? No. And, but when she left, how did you really feel about that? Well, I knew she was right. I was a little embarrassed about it, but I still didn't know what to do about it. And so you were kind of uh, saying, what, what should I do next? That yes. kind of a thing. Yeah. And th there, there was no real help that you knew of, but now you knew that others knew that you needed some help. Yeah. Okay. She offered to tell me I was <laughs> fat. She didn't offer to help me to get skinny. Oh, that's the kind of people that are, what do they say, kind people, the kind we don't need, right? Yeah. <laughs> we asked Naomi about re what really made her decide to do something about her weight and health in general, and here's what she shared with us. As I got a little older and I had gotten remarried, uh, at first I had lost a little bit of weight because there was such a dramatic change in my life, but then as time went on, you become more contented and it seems like everybody's needs were first, and so I still wasn't paying attention to what I needed to do for myself. And it wasn't until just the last few years that I have noticed that my health was really being affected by my weight. I did try Weight Watchers at one time. I did lose some weight, and that was probably the first time I ever really learned how to cook right, how to eat right. I still didn't know how to cook right. I knew that, you know, I should have fruits and vegetables and and even though I've always sort of known that, nobody's ever really taught me that, that, that how important that was to our health. About three years ago, we had a very exciting surprise where my daughter had told me that she was pregnant and was, so it was going to be my first grandchild. And about that time, I realized how important it was that I start taking care of myself if I wanted to be around and watch these grandchildren grow up. During this time also, my health seemed to have been going steadily downhill, and again, I just wasn't sure what to do about it. I was having a lot of chest pains. I was having a lot of acid reflux. Um, I just caught every single cold that went around. Somebody could sneeze, and I'd have a full-blown cold, it seemed like. Every flu that went around, I was catching, so I knew that there just wasn't anything healthy about my body at that point, and I really, really needed to do something, and I needed to do it quickly. So you knew that you had a problem. Your friend had shared that with you, but now you were sensing that. But you had a, another element here. You had another reason, the grandkids. How many grandchildren do you have? I have three now. And you had how many then? That was the first one. That was one. the first one. And have these other two giving you more reasons? <laughs> well, that's great. So what did you finally do? Well, we heard about the uh, CHIP class here at the Three Angels Church, and so I joined it and came. Sounds like an interesting class. What does CHIP stand for? Is that like chocolate chip? Is that Dorito chips? Is that potato chips? What, what is that? That's what I had before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what, does that, what is the CHIP uh, program about? For Cardiac Health Improvement Project. Okay. And it teaches you how to eat right and why you need to learn to eat right, what it does to your body. So uh, you went through that program, and uh, they actually showed you what to do. Yes. Hands-on yes. type stuff. They did. Did the food taste good? It was a little interesting at first, but it became very good. Okay. <laughs> now I understand, did, did they have you cook the food, or do other people cook it for you there? Well, they had samples every night, and that helped us. And then every weekend, every Sunday, we had classes where we were able to bring food also. Okay, great. Um, and what happened to you physically? What kind of physical changes came as a result of that, that time in the CHIP program? Well, I, have, I started CHIP in February, and I've now lost 30 pounds. February of what? This, this of year? This year. This year. And you've lost 30 pounds. Correct. And so how many months ago is that? That's nine months ago. Nine months ago, okay. And wow. I kept it off. I, you know, I took it off within the first four months, but I've been able to keep it off the whole time. What and about it, your numbers, other numbers? My cholesterol has gone from 225 down to 189. Wow, that's a, that's a sizable drop. Yes. And I was taking high blood pressure medicine, and now I'm not. Wonderful. You feel better? I feel a lot better. And, you f and those grandkids have a more energetic grandmother. They do. I can now get up off the floor once I've gotten down there with them. 
<laughs> great. That's great. Well, coming up next, we're going to be talking with a doctor who deals with obesity every day, and we'll find out what is causing our pro weight problems in America, why we eat so much, and so stay with us. We'll be right back. Next week on Up Close. We're going to be talking about how to tame your TV. I know with the kids, I don't really want them to watch like violence or like scary movies and stuff like that. Nope, I usually, I watch everything. Our lives are stressful, we come home tired, we're looking forward to doing something different, and television gives us a chance to tune out. How would a child be different who watched a lot of television? The brain is always plastic. It's always plastic and it can be modified. Next week on Up Close, Taming Your TV. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Up Close. Today we're talking about the problem of obesity and our special guest is Dr. Gerard McLean from Reading, Pennsylvania. Dr. McLean earned his doctorate in public health from Loma Linda University. He and his wife, Catherine, have co-authored a cookbook, Tastefully Vegan. I must say, I've had some of the cooking from that book. It's an excellent book. Please welcome with me, Dr. McLean. Well, these were some testimonies. This was an interesting testimony we heard from Naomi. It's awesome what she's done. You know, and she's doing the right things. In America today, over two-thirds of us adults are overweight, and one-third of us are actually obese. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because the more weight we carry, in fact, we're twice as likely to die prematurely if we're obese. Twice as likely. And so it's, it's something that's really skyrocketing. I mean, I gave that statistic about five-year-olds mm -hmm. that are even now overweight. We're finding that uh, almost 25% uh, of the uh, Caucasian children and 33% of Hispanics and African American children are overweight in school today. When you think back when we were in school, how many of our classmates were overweight? There might have been one or two. And today, you know, a third of our children are overweight, and why? Why is that? Yeah, why, why are they doing it? Is it? Primary reason, same reason adults are overweight. We drive our kids to school every day, and I recommend that. Uh -huh. But they don't get enough exercise, and sometimes that physical education classes are no longer part of a, of a required curriculum. And there's such an affinity and a predisposition to eat too much of the fast food, snack foods that are available today. What about the uh, school cafeterias and the pop machines? Well, those can be a real problem too. In fact, many, many schools have taken out the soda pop machines and they replaced them with, with juice machines. And that's, and that's healthy. Is that, so that's better. Uh, you know, we have the dubious distinction. We're here in Kansas. It actually was in Garden City, Kansas, where the first pop machines were allowed in schools. Wow. And so uh, they uh, begin to market that up and, and whatnot. What about supermarkets? Uh, you know, I noticed that they, they have all the very high-fat foods right at the bottom where the kids can grab them. Well, the, the supermarkets are interested in selling a product, and I don't blame them at all. And they will sell whatever we will purchase. When we've gone and, and done cooking schools, in various cities where, where we've lived, in fact, my wife and I, uh, we will visit the store early on. They have a small section for tofu. Three and four years later, they marvel at that section is four or five times larger. And they don't realize that we're there and we're educating the population to buy more tofu, to buy more healthy food. You can buy all the healthy food you want in these regular grocery stores we have today. You just have to be re-educate your taste buds to know what to choose let me ask you a more philosophical question. Why do, why do you think it is that we're, uh, we're getting larger? There's more bounce to the ounce, <laughs> so to speak. Well, when we think back, you know, five, 50, 60 years ago, our ancestors, even 100 years ago, when they uh, went around their daily life, they had to exercise. Today, our daily lives involve walking to the car or the bus. And then we sit to go wherever we got to go. And then when we get to where we're going, we sit some more. How many of us, when we go shopping, we cruise that grocery store and look for that parking spot right in front of the store? You know, it's got your name on it. You know? And where I tell everybody to park way over there, uh -huh. 
so that you'll get some exercise of going back and forth to and from the store, and you won't be parking next to those, um, shall I say, unkind persons who open their car door and smash it into your door right. and dent up your car. So there's two benefits for parking away. Well, that kind of leads into uh, a question I wanted to ask. I mean, we're having this problem with, with too much fat and obesity. What can we do to get off the fat? Well, the, one of the primary things we have to do is look at our diet, and diet is very important. It's really a good idea to attend cooking schools, attend weight loss classes, attend some sort of seminars to learn about the food that's good for you. You know, we need to be eating fruits and vegetables, nuts and grains, in, in the moderate amounts. In fact, if we eat enough of those, I don't object to some people eating some of the other less healthy foods. Mm -hmm. If they want to have some of the snack foods, okay, as long as they've had um, five servings of fruits per day, um, uh, or uh, two to four servings of fruits per day, three to five servings of vegetables per day, six to 11 servings of whole grain products per day, one serving of protein foods, whether it be soy or, or nuts. And then if you're still hungry, you can have some of those uh, less desirable, less healthy foods, but more desirable foods because of the, the fat content that's in there and some of the other things are there. You know, in uh, some of the health programs that we've run here, Three Angels, Naomi was talking about coming to a program here. We found that when people uh, come to us, they really don't know how to find those foods in the store. Isn't that true, Naomi? Uh, did we help you at all know how to find things in the store? Right. It, you, you told us where we could find them, and, and there was some available in the, the store that the church has. Now, in your class, did we have the shopping tour during that time, or did we not have one that time? Many times so. we have a, like a shopping tour where they take them in and show them right where the foods are. I don't know about you, but whenever I do the shopping for our family, which is not very often anymore, uh, after I brought home some of the things that my wife didn't think were <laughs> essential, um, uh, you know, once you go to a store, you kind of know exactly where you want to go. You know what's on aisle number three and aisle number four, and, and you kind of just go on automatic pilot, right? And then they renovate the store, and all panic breaks out. <laughs> a Actually, shopping tour is really a good idea, yeah. because you can go to any of the supermarkets, and you can find the healthy food when you know where to look. Let me ask you one other question, and, uh, and that is this. Is fat addictive? I think we have to look at it from the point of view of what makes food taste good. Food, is a, food tastes good. What makes food taste good? There are three primary ingredients. Number one, fat. Two, sugar. Sugar. And three, salt. spices, salt. of which salt is the one we are particularly concerned about because those individuals susceptible to high blood pressure can have a problem with salt. So is, is fat addictive? I think anything that makes us feel good is addictive. And if that fat makes you feel good, then yes, it can be addictive. Coming up next, we'll introduce you to a man who lost 50 pounds through lifestyle changes. Please stay with us for his encouraging story. Have you found those pounds piling up? Are you struggling to lose unwanted weight but haven't succeeded? If so, we have just the book for you. Find help as you read Dieting, Victory from the Jaws of Defeat. For your free gift, just write to us today at Up Close, Post Office Box 220, West Frankfort, Illinois, 62896. Or call during regular business hours, 800-752-3226 or 618-627-4651. Ask for Up Close Offer Number 9. Welcome back to Up Close. Today we're talking about how a good diet can help us overcome the weight problem. Our next guest is Tim Healy from Battle Creek, Michigan. His wife, Linda, had been concerned about his weight for some time. But one day she read an announcement in her newspaper that made all the difference. Let's take a look. In 1975, I was a young mother with two children. I had married my high school sweetheart, and I had watched his muscular body frame becoming a little flabbier. And he comes from a family that has a high incidence, very high incidence of obesity and diabetes. And I did not want to see what was happening to his family, happening to him. 
I wanted to keep him around for a very long time. I saw an advertisement in the newspaper that entailed a day of activities for my children, fun activities, and for myself, an exercise class and another class of art or, or health. There was a, it was advertised as a cooking school for vegetarians, and I was very interested in that uh, class. And I signed up for it, and I was not disappointed. Um, the class in, was for five weeks, and it entailed five health principles, or nutritional nuggets. And the first class was on um, eating a healthy breakfast around a table designed for eating, and to replace the refined carbohydrates with uh, complex carbohydrates. And they gave us recipes on how to implement that. I took that little nugget home and um, asked my husband, or enticed him, literally enticed him, to say, "Hun, we're going to get up early in the morning, and we're all going to sit around the table, and I'm going to make you really good food. I'm going to make you whole grain pancakes. I'm going to make you good muffins. And um, instead of eggs, we're going to have scrambled tofu and whole grain breads. And he liked that idea. And as we incorporated that, just that one principle, uh, my husband started losing weight. That's great. You know, it's really important when you're changing uh, to have the, what you're changing to taste good. Well, the effects of this new way of cooking had immediate results on Tim and his family. But at least initially, he had some reservations. Let's take a look. When Linda came home from the cooking class, she was interested in my health, of course, and she decided to make some changes. And she just wanted to throw out everything that we had, and I thought we could just eat it and then not buy that refined things anymore. But she decided that it was better, that if it wasn't good for us, it wasn't good for anybody, so she threw it out. Uh, she began to replace our diet with truly something better. She began to make whole grain pancakes and muffins, as she said, and it it was delicious, and I decided that if um, she was going to keep feeding me well, that I would go along with the dietary changes. Um, I, After a, a week or so, I realized that my suit was getting a little looser, and I was losing some weight. Um, after a month, I realized that I had lost 25 pounds, and I had to get my suit altered. And so they took the pants in, and... Um, I continued to lose weight. Uh, the second time I took my suit in to get altered, the man said that I would have to get a new suit because if I altered the pants anymore, I would only have one pocket across the back instead of two. So I bought a new suit, and uh, over about a six-month period of time, I lost about 50 pounds. Um, working as an accountant, I realized that I was able to think a little bit clearer, do my work a little bit better, and uh, also we started walking more with our children and uh, really began enjoying life a little bit more. Um, shortly after the classes, uh, my wife invited the instructors over to our house, and they gave me a personal cooking class right in my living room. We began to visit these folks in their home. We started Bible studies with them um, and really enjoyed the changes in lifestyle that uh, the Adventist Church holds. We began going out into the country, uh, talking about gardening, talking about natural remedies, this type of thing, which uh, appealed to both my wife and I. During this process, I realized that there was more than just the food involved, that it was an entire lifestyle change. Wow, that's great. You know, we're happy to have Tim with us today, and we'd like to ask him to come up, so let's welcome Tim together. Good to have you here, Tim. Thanks and uh, let's see, do you have one pocket or two? No, we have two now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is great. Your wife kind of uh, uh, carried you along. She did. It was uh, her insistence because she was the cook and um, I was the eater at the time. And I figured if she was going to cook things that I would continue to eat them as long as they tasted good. So now she sees you with that muscular frame that she talked about when you were in high school again. Yes, well, it took a little bit, a little bit to get back to that, and I'm, it's a work of a lifetime. It's a transition that takes a while. How long did it take you to get used to eating things that were good for you? 
Most things took me not very long at all because, like I said, she was a good cook. Um, my wife and two children became instant vegetarians. Uh, I still ate out for lunch every day. I was required to by work. Um, and it took me probably about six or eight months to eat 100% whole wheat bread because it was pretty tough. You mean it was hard or tough? It was hard. Okay. And was this bread uh, just because of the taste? Because of the taste and because she was learning how to bake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, That's a learning experience also. Yes. Sometimes those, those burnt sacrifices at the yes. beginning are not so easy to, to take care of. Um, and so the kids really, how old were the kids when this change was made? My children were two and four at the time. Okay. So and it, it, wasn't a, it was an easy transition for them. Right. And now you said you eat out a lot or you did at that time. Uh, w what did you do when you went out to eat? How did you find healthy foods then? Or did you cheat a little bit? Well, I wasn't as convinced as she was that it was the way to go at the beginning. Um, I was an accountant. The job I ha was on at the time um, was an audit of a large grocery store chain that had a uh, salad bar. So I did begin eating a lot more vegetables than I normally would have. So the big change was breakfast and uh, then trying to just move towards foods that foods has grown? The beginning, we, I cut out everything I considered junk food. Like my wife said, we began eating a big breakfast and um, I stopped eating in between meals. We also began eating very little for dinner. So we had a transition into almost a two meal a day plan. Interesting. And that simple change alone, how much was it you lost? It was about 50 pounds over eight or nine months. That's great. Have you kept it off? I've kept a large portion of it off, but like the sedentary job that I have, um, it's hard when I don't exercise. These people coming into your home and having that personal cooking school, that was probably quite amazing to you. That made all the difference in the world. It made a, a deep impression on me because nobody had ever taken that much of a personal interest in us before. And how long did that cooking school go on in your home before you started talking more about some of the philosophical things and the, you know, the Christian uh, background to health? Well, after the first class, my wife went up to, the, and this was the class that she took, I see. Uh, went up to the instructors and said she knew there was more going on than just health, and she wanted to know what that was. And so they gave her a couple of books, one of which she stayed up all night and read. And uh, almost immediately after that series of five classes, she invited them over to our house, and we had another five series, uh, five class series in our living room. Is that right? Now, uh, so how long after that was it, is it that you joined the, the Adventist church, that faith community? It's about six months. Six months. Right. Excellent. The cooking schools led into Bible studies because you have to show somebody where all the health principles are in the Bible, and we did that, and those health principles led into other principles that we began studying as well. Now, you know, do you help other people like you were helped at this point? We do. I have a natural foods wholesale business, so wow. we... <laughs> We deliver good food to people all whole over the place. Whole wheat bread? Uh, we deliver whole wheat grains <laughs> <laughs> and other whole grains. Uh, we also do nutrition classes with our church and uh, help as many people as we can. Do any tailor tailoring on people's suits to make them smaller? No, that's not an area of expertise I, <laughs> I hold. Well, we're so happy that you're with us, and we're going to hear a little bit more from you a little bit later in the program. When we come back, we're going to be talking with Dr. McLean about what we can do to take those pounds off and keep them off. And a little later, we'll be taking questions from our live audience, so don't go away. Next week on Up Close. We're going to be talking about how to tame your TV. I know with the kids, I don't really want them to watch, like, violence or, like, scary movies and stuff like that. No, nope. I usually, I watch everything. Our lives are stressful, we come home tired, we're looking forward to doing something different, and television gives us a chance to tune out. How would a child be different who watched a lot of television? The brain is always plastic. It's always plastic, and it can be modified. Next week on Up Close, Taming Your TV. Don't miss it. Back to up close, we're talking about the problem of obesity with Dr. Gerard McLean. This was great, this testimony that uh, we heard. It was awesome. Um, 
You know, one, one thing that uh, Tim began to mention was the support group that he had with people coming back to his house. And maybe we should just talk about that for a moment. You know, it's not difficult to lose weight. Mm. The difficult part is to keep losing weight if you want to and then keep off what you've lost. And I, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask um, Tim or Naomi if they want to respond to this. Has there been a support group of individuals involved to help you be successful in your weight loss? You guys can arm wrestle about who goes first here. Which one of you wants to say first? Okay. Ladies first. Go ahead, Naomi. There has been a terrific support group for me. Uh, we've been going to the CHIP alumni classes every once a month, and you eat each other's food, and you, you learn how to cook more, and, and there's a good support group. And I have a personal friend that is doing it with me also, and that's been a tremendous help. And this support group isn't something that should only last for a few months. It may have to last the rest of your life. Mm. And I think it's available. Sure. sure. Yes. Tim. We found a support group within the church, and then by actively helping other people by doing nutrition classes ourselves, uh, we found that a real support to ourselves sure. as well. You know, a lady back in our church back in Reading, um, Kim lost um, about 80 pounds successfully in a program that began in the church. 80 pounds. 80 pounds. It was a, they, they meet on a regular basis. They are involved with Bible study, exercise, food. They're bringing in res recipes to, mm -hmm. to uh, share with each other. And they're continuing to learn the key principles to be successful with their weight loss. Yeah, I think this is so important, the, the support structure. Wouldn't you say probably around the world, if people are watching, that their local Seventh-day Adventist church, that's one of the things they bring to the equation in the Christian community. I mean, if you want to go someplace where they know at least something about health and they're going to support it, it might not be as much at one place as another, but they're, sure. going, to, they're going to understand it. They usually have a health food co-op or they have this or that, uh, you know, and so, yeah, that's a good place for support. There's lots of programs available. In fact, uh, uh, you and I both have been to Florida um, in in February when they have a health summit and there are there are at any one time 18 or 19 different programs that are people can come and learn how to be instructors when they go back to their church on various and kinds of programs there's cooking schools eight weeks to wellness uh, weight management depression many different programs that you can learn and you know we our churches are known for cooking schools sure yeah um, and you know even faith communities that are other than Seventh-day Adventist I saw some people there at that summit and you don't have to even be in a church to know how to help people, but certainly that support structure is there. Let me ask you a question. You know, we've talked about diet. Is there anything else we need to do when we talk about weight well, loss? Sure. I think, um, well, you know, diet being a key factor, of course, the second most important factor is making sure you are involved in expending enough calories. You know, we, it's no trouble for us to eat lots of calories. In fact, that's what gets us in trouble. But when we don't involve ourselves in enough physical activity we don't expend enough calories and we need to be expending calories at least 500 to 700 calories a day of exercise now what does that mean yeah how do you figure that out you figure that out it takes about a hundred calories a mile of whatever you're doing of whatever you're doing okay driving in the car no <laughs> okay, so uh, you mean in terms of exercise? Walking or running or riding a bicycle. If you were swimming, you might burn more. Mm -hmm. If you're riding a bicycle fast, you'd burn more. But the bicycle is actually eliminating some of the gravity, so there's not quite as much exercise unless you're really pedaling fast. But frankly, it doesn't matter what kind of exercise you use, as long as it's increasing your calorie output. Mm -hmm. Now. No one should leave here and begin an exercise program tomorrow because you might end up doing too much too soon. We need to begin gradually. You might want to talk with your physician or a physical therapist or some professional medical person in your church or in your community to learn how to get started. But the important thing is to get started. Mm -hmm. A key principle is you can do anything. As long as you can still carry on a conversation, you're probably not exercising too much. Mm. If you're can't carry on a conversation because you're huffing and puffing, you're exercising too much. Is exercising too much harmful for you? Most people know. Some people, it could increase your risk of heart attack or raise your blood pressure too high, but most people, it just makes us 
two or three days later, we're too stiff and sore, we realize that, aha, exercise really isn't good for me because I feel bad now. But if you start out gradually, it's really a good idea for those that have never exercised before to join a fitness center for three months and learn the principles. Mm, yeah. They will teach you how to do it slowly and safely. Now, if you have evidence of significant disease, you need to probably see a physician and get a medical clearance. But most physicians are going to recommend you exercise anyways. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that whatever uh, you do in terms of exercise, if you go about a mile, it expends 100 calories. A lot of people that have, have grown up with, uh, within school systems and whatnot, everything they did that was exercise related was related to sports. It was yeah. related to basketball. It was related to football. It was related to these different things. And then when they get out of school, they don't have those teams. They don't have that support. They don't want to join a team on, you know, at the Y or different things. And I think people really get in, you know, it almost cripples them in terms of their own personal exercise. What would you say to them? Well, as we enter the workforce, we leave college or school, we enter the workforce, we tend to become sedentary. While it's okay to continue involved in some of those team sports, if you're up to it, Sometimes we get involved on the weekends in some of these team sports and, and it's too much for our 40, 50, or 60-year-old bodies and we get injuries. But the important thing is to be active. It's okay to do team sports, but you don't have to. One activity I really like is table tennis because it's inexpensive. Anybody can play table tennis. You don't have to be good to enjoy it. And when you chase that ball around the floor, <laughs> you're bending, <laughs> twisting, you're getting good exercise. And if you are good, and your partner's not, you should use your non-dominant hand while they use their dominant hand. That way e it equals things out. <laughs> it's good exercise. So if you want to do th things with your children or your grandkids, that's one. You can go for a walk. You take your dog for a walk. Um, you probably don't want to take your cat because they're not much good for that. <laughs> <laughs> I got cat at home. I got two dogs at home. Um, it, it's good to take your animals for a walk, your, your spouse for your walk. You know, there, there's some social time that, that you can have in, in that. Right. If the, of course, if it's a huge Great Dane, make sure you have a short leash. Yeah, right. They need to be well trained. And get ahead of you. It can be a problem. But what about uh, you folks here, Naomi and, and Tim? What kind of exercise do you do? I, or do you? Yeah, I okay. do. My wife and I walk a lot, and I also play basketball once or twice a week. Okay. And I walk a lot also. I try to do between three and five miles a day. Three to five miles a day. I Did try. you walk here? Excellent. Uh, it's 60 miles here. Oh, 60 yeah. miles. Well, so you started a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, great. It, it would be best if we exercised every day. Every day. Now, that's not always realistic, and so we generally recommend five days a week. Now, three days a week is, is enough exercise to maintain your physical fitness or your fitness level. If your fitness level is very poor, three times a week is to maintain a low fitness level. So we want to get to five. I like to plan for exercising every day. So if you miss one or two days because of weather or committee meetings or other appointments, you're still getting five. Now, often people, oftentimes people ask the question, what about exercising all at once or can you break it up into different sessions? And, mm -hmm. and it Good all question. is accumulative. It all works out. It's okay to exercise 45 minutes or 60 minutes one time, but you can do 20 minutes at a time or 15 minutes at a time. If the weather gets bad, go to the mall. Does it ever get cold in Kansas? For Kansans it does, <laughs> but people that grew up in other places, you know, they don't know what's happening. If it gets too cold outside, if, it gets, um, if it's too rainy, uh, you can go to the mall. The mall owners love for you to go to the mall. Just leave your credit card at home lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, you don't want to uh, shift a little bit because we've talked a little bit about uh, diet. We've talked a little bit about exercise. What about this epidemic that's coming with childhood ob uh, obesity? If you get overweight below the age of 5 or 10 or 15, is that, what, what kind of effect is that going to have in later life? Well, it's going to have a compounding effect later in life because these young children have been overweight longer. In fact, we're finding that uh, adult diseases are showing up in children. And the one I'm particularly thinking about is type 2 diabetes or adult onset diabetes. We typically used to see that show up in the mid-40s, early 50s, and now we're seeing it in the early teens. One of the primary reasons is our young people are overweight, some of them are obese, and they're not exercising, they're not eating the right kinds of foods, and they're coming down with these metabolic diseases that used to show up 
in adulthood in our 40s and 50s. And when we have exposure to those diseases young, we're going to get more complications earlier in life. More complications early in life. So it's really, it's really important what society is trying to do to really bring this fight against obesity to the fore. Well, it, it's paramount. We're, we've got increased diabetes, increased heart disease, increased cholesterols, increased blood pressure, increased strokes, and increase of many cancers, all because of being overweight and obese. So let's say there's, uh, there's a family that's watching and mom and dad are overweight, all the kids are overweight, and they say, yeah, this is right, we need to do this. What are the steps they need to take? Give me like the three top five steps they need to take. Well, I think the first thing would be to find some, po some people who are teaching some, some healthy eating classes. Uh, many, uh, the Adventist churches teach them in many communities. Uh, there's lots of exercise opportunities in the YMCA's, in, in some of the fitness centers. And there's lots of support groups that can be available. Uh, Curves is an excellent program that's out there. Uh, I wish I'd thought of it. Um, but uh, women get together in a, um, in a little shopping center and they exercise at certain times of the day. It, it particularly doesn't involve food, but they recommend good healthy food. And so that, a cooking class? A cooking class, an exercise class, food. and then some support groups, whether stay involved in those cooking and exercise classes or join some support groups or create your own support group. What are some specific things about the diet? Well, we need to be aware of the fat we eat. We should be eating good fats and stay away from the bad fat. Well, what is bad fat? Um, saturated fat of animal origin is harmful, is, is more harmful to us when we eat too much or any for some folks. Um, trans fatty acids are harmful to us. These are vegetable fats that have been partially hydrogenated. So when you read the package, and we should all be taught how to read food labels, we should eat nothing or very little foods that say partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. These are trans fatty acids, and they're, they act like saturated fats. So avoid the saturated fats and the trans fats. Eat some of the good fats, like nuts and seeds. Nuts are high in fat, but they're not fattening unless we eat too many calories, you see. It's the calories that's the problem, not the fat. We also need to be eating the right kinds of carbohydrates. We have this phenomenon sweeping the country called low-carb diets. And there's some, there's some good and bad in those. The low-carb diets recommend less carbs, and they recommend more protein and fat. Well, we need to be careful of eating too much protein and fat, particularly animal origin, because they tend to increase one's risk of heart disease, cancer, uh, stroke, and diabetes. The good carbs. Um, a lot of people become confused because they see low-carb foods that they can eat. They think they can eat lots of them. They may be high in carbohydrates. You can eat 1,500 calories worth of low-carb foods, and it won't fill you up. You can eat 300 calories of fruit and vegetables and lentils, and you're plumb full. Because of the fiber? Because of the fiber, because of the quantity and the fiber. Okay, so we have... Uh, go to a uh, cooking school, get on an exercise program. At the cooking school, make sure they're teaching you about uh, the carbs, the, what's good fat, what's bad fat. Go to a cooking school, have a support group, anything else? Understand the importance of fiber. Fiber. Understand the importance of drinking water. Okay. Understand the importance of, of um, balanced nutrition. Okay. Understand the importance of uh, portion control. Great. I will come to Tim because he, has a, he, he works with this all the time. You have people come in and they're probably asking you these kind of questions. What do you say? Same things. Same drink, kind of thing. drink water, exercise, whole grains, nothing in between meals. And you're just, you just show them what to do. Do you have people that come to your store because of your, of your knowledge and how they're, you're helping them? Somewhat, yeah. And you and your wife do cooking schools and whatnot? Yes. What, what about hunger pains? Hunger pains. Okay. What does, about does anybody have hunger pains? Is hunger okay? You know, I, I, I tell people that when you're hungry, praise God. Because it probably means you don't have cancer. Okay? Hunger is a good, natural, physiological response. And when I get hungry, I look at my watch. If it's time to eat, I eat. If it's not time to eat, I don't. You respond to hunger pains differently. Once we teach ourselves to respond to hunger differently. 
we don't have to feed ourselves. Some of us have been raised with parents who went through the depression years and when they were, they had real hunger for days. You, you know, I guarantee you, hunger is not going to hurt you. Now, let's be a little bit careful. If you're diabetic, that's a little bit different. Sometimes we can have severe low blood sugar reactions that it's mandatory, it's an emergency situation. We need to eat something that gives us calories and quickly absorb calories. But that's a, that's a treatment situation. That's not something we want to do all the time. So when we eat good, balanced carbohydrates with an adequate amount of protein and fats, we're going to have you know, a good breakfast, like Tim mentioned, a good breakfast. And four to five hours later, we're going to be hungry again for a good lunch. And four or five hours later, we're going to be hungry again for a mild or modest evening meal. What about water? Most people don't drink enough water. And it's good not to drink with the meal, but it's okay if you do. I look at those as one of the minor things. It's best not to drink with the meal, but if you have to, it's okay. But if you're drinking enough water between meals, you usually don't need to drink with the meal. And you're drinking enough water. If you have a clear or almost clear urine at midday, if you're drinking enough water, if you have to use the restroom every one and a half to two hours, if you have difficulty sitting through a full church service, you know you're drinking enough water. It's, it's good to be expelling that urine because we know we're drinking enough water. All right, yeah, so it uh, depends on how long the preacher goes, too, with that church service, right? <laughs> True. That's exactly right. Well, we, when we come back, we're going to be taking some questions from our live audience, so I hope that you can stay with us, and maybe they'll be asking some questions that you're thinking right now. Have you found those pounds piling up? Are you struggling to lose unwanted weight but haven't succeeded? If so, we have just the book for you. Find help as you read Dieting, Victory from the Jaws of Defeat. For your free gift, just write to us today at Up Close, Post Office Box 220, West Frankfort, Illinois, 62896, or call during regular business hours, 800-752-3226 or 618-627-4651. Ask for Up Close Offer Number 9. Welcome back to Up Close. We're talking today about how to lose weight, and we're going to take some questions from our audience. And you know, uh, before we take the first question, someone was talking to me during the break and said, if we lose something psychologically, uh, that's kind of a bad connotation. Wouldn't it be uh, better to say we're releasing weight instead of losing that? What do you think about that? Sure, I think that's a good principle. When you lose something, you tend to want to find it again. In fact, that's right. When our fat cells become, when they shrink, when we don't follow the right principles, it's very easy for them to fill up again. And so when you lose that fat, it's very easy to find them and fill them up again. So it's a good principle to release it. But when you release something, you need to fill it, you need to fill it with something else. Sure, and I liked how Tim said that when his wife took away all his food. And he said, please, let us finish it first. <laughs> it was all right, Tim. And then... Uh, then she replaced it with just wonderful food. Okay, our first question. What's your name and what's your question? Amy Sherard. <clears throat> and not Gerard, but Sherard. <laughs> and uh, I have discussed weight problems with many people. Uh, they often tell me, that when I ask them, how many diets have you been on? And they can't even count them. There have been so many. Uh, this type of yo-yoing uh, up and then... Uh, down and up and down. What are the long-range effects of this? And is it possible to to change a person's so-called set point so that they actually, in the end, require much fewer calories to keep going? And for what's the long-range? Well, you know, you, you talk about this this yo-yo effect. We, it's very easy to lose weight, at least those first 25 or 30 pounds. It's what's difficult is, is keeping that weight off and continuing to lose. Now we will lose, then we'll go on a plateau for a while, then we'll lose and go on a plateau. This is where exercise becomes so key. Exercise helps 
raise that metabolism, assuming you have a normal thyroid to begin with, exercise will help raise that metabolism so you can continue to lose weight. This, this set point you mentioned is, is very key with exercise. Now, in some of the studies that were done 30, 40, 50 years ago, when you look at the activity level of those 40, four or five decades ago, we find that they're much more active than those of us today in our decade. And ac activity is very key. Now, what is more important, diet or exercise? I don't like to answer that question because I think they're both important. You cannot do one without the other. The proper food in balance and the proper exercise in balance. Now, most of us just don't get enough physical activity. I don't like to use the word exercise because that, con that brings up connotations of pain, there's no pain, no gain kind of thing back in PE classes. What I like to get us thinking about is being more physically active. I've conducted classes for individuals in wheelchairs to help them be more physically active. Exercise for them is just as important as it is for you and I. And that, that set point is probably most critically related to physical activity. Mm. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? What's your question, please? My name is Kevin, and uh, my question is related to uh, breakfast. Uh, many people frequently in trying to lose weight uh, will leave breakfast off as a way to lose weight, thinking that if they eat breakfast, it's going to increase their hunger later in the day, uh, maybe in the morning or the afternoon. Is there, uh, is there different uh, things that one can eat at breakfast that's going to not end up with uh, hunger in the mid-morning? Sure. Um, I like to tell folks to eat as much breakfast as they want. I make no limitations on the quantity of breakfast as long as it's healthy. You know, the whole grains, the fruits. Some people even eat vegetables for breakfast. I can't do that. But some people can't. It's okay. But what's important is the, the, the oatmeal, the old-fashioned oatmeal, the, the whole grain cereals that we have the whole grain breads and fruits. I give absolutely no limitations on quantity for breakfast. What I do like to limit is food eaten after 6 o'clock should be none in the evening or just fruits or salads. That way it can be low in calories. In fact, uh, many people have said we should eat breakfast like a king and, and our midday meal like a prince or a princess, uh, smaller amounts, and then eat the evening meal like someone who doesn't have much food in the house. Uh, that's very hard to do. We typically don't eat much for breakfast. We'll eat maybe a little or a lot for lunch, and we eat a lot for the evening meal because it tends to be the only time the family gets together for a meal. But we need to reverse it. Okay. So, um, we have our... Next question, please. What's your name and what's your question? I am Linda, being an OR nurse. If a person has tried to lose weight and tried every way possible and still has not been able to lose weight, is having a gastric bypass an acceptable measure to take? Well, I think you clinically have to make those decisions with your own physician. I think it's a, it, it, is a, it is an opportunity that some can have. I would like to recommend we do the other first, but if you can't do those, there are surgical opportunities that can benefit some people, but I've seen too many people have complications afterwards. Well, uh, yeah, these complications come, are there, uh, I guess it would have to be specifically for that individual whether or not they have the, I guess they, what do they do, they staple the stomach well, the, or different things like that? Those individuals who are morbidly obese uh, can greatly benefit from those sorts of surgical interventions. Uh, I would recommend those to your personal physician and your own personal sure. medical condition. Another question, please. My name is David Green. I was wondering if, if it is regular, regularity important in weight management. That's a good question. Um, I do recommend regular meals. Uh, we are creatures of habit, and we can tend to benefit from regularity times for breakfast, lunch, and our evening meal. Some can benefit from two meals a day. Um, most can benefit from three meals a day. There are some individuals, um, 
think they, they need five or six meals a day, but uh, in clinics that I've been associated with, we put those on three meals a day and they do just fine. Next question, please. What's your name and your question? Uh, my name is Cindy Seward, and I just was curious about trans fats. What exactly are they examples, and does it stay in your system, and how long, and is there a cleansing regimen that you need to get rid of yeah, trans fats? Good question. Fats? Trans fatty acids are also called these hy partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. What the scientists have done is they've created a vegetable oil for us to eat. The first ones that came out years ago was corn oil. Um, it's liquid at room temperature, but when you add it into the baking and, and packaged food products, it doesn't have the longevity or shelf life that we need. And so they, they add some hydrogen ions with a, uh, a nickel and cadmium catalyst, and they hydrogenate. They add hydrogen ions to it. They make it, um, they, they, they give it less double bonds. All the double bonds allow it to be kinked. And these kinked fatty, these fatty acid chains that are kinked they cannot align themselves up tightly. The saturated fats have no double bonds. They can be aligned very quickly, and these vegetable trans fatty acids can be aligned very quickly, and they can create hardship in our arteries when we eat too much of these fats. So trans fatty acids act like animal saturated fats. We thank you so much for the questions that you've brought to us. And you know, uh, this is, of course, a huge subject. And we haven't been able to talk about everything that's been involved in the subject, but I think we've gotten a good handle on not only diet, but exercise and then support groups. We've seen some excellent testimonies and different things that have helped us see how people have moved uh, from problems to solutions. What would be your closing remarks uh, to just kind of cap this off? Well, I think we all have to remember that God loves us whether we're overweight, whether we're obese, or whether we're sin. He makes, or whether we're thin. He makes no distinctions. In fact, in 3 John 2, God tells us that uh, He wishes that we prosper and be in health. And, you know, He wants us to be healthy. But He also has to follow the laws of science. That if we choose to eat too much of the saturated fats and choose not to exercise or be physically active, there are consequences to that. Yet he wants us to be happy. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be holy. How can we do that? Sometimes it's tough. Um, we have some emotional issues that sometimes we want to eat food to help us with some stressful times. That's okay. But if it gives us other medical problems, then maybe it's not okay. It's important to get help. Whenever you need help, get help. We want to thank our guests today, Naomi Coleman, Tim Healy, and Dr. Gerard McLean for being with us. You know, this subject of what we eat, when we eat it, how we eat it, uh, is uh, much deeper for some of us, or actually all of us, when we begin to ponder the opening stories in Scripture, where many things had to do with the fall of man as it related to appetite. Then when we look at Christ's life, we also recognize that he was successful in this same struggle. And I like a text in the book of Philippians that talks to us about how through God's power He can work in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. And as we look to Him, He can give us both the desire and the ability. So I want to direct your minds and your thoughts to Him. As the Master Physician, thank you so much for joining us in this Up Close.